Good morning and welcome to First Cumberland's virtual service for Sunday, the 31st of May. As you watch this, your brothers and sisters in Christ are in this room and we are having a live service. And we miss you, but we're very happy that you have decided to be with us in this way today. We hope you're well. We're praying for you. Hope you're receiving calls from friends asking what your uh, situation is. I uh, hope you're praying for us as well. We are thankful for you and thankful that you've tuned in this morning. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to announce that uh, a virtual communion service will be offered to you in this same format on Saturday, June 6. And uh, we want you not to miss that. Just prepare for that with juice and, and crackers or however that you would ordinarily do. We welcome you to that as well. You may have heard that pools are being allowed to open in Chattanooga, and our pool is going to be opened as well. The uh, CYF committee took some time uh, to think about this and to see what would be best. As you may understand, operating a pool of this size is, is, a, is an astonishing expense. And they had to weigh the situation as to whether leaving the pool as it was and not cleaning it and filling it up with water would be healthy for that pool or not and whether it would be financially feasible. We're hoping that it will be. We are selling pool memberships uh, and, uh, and hopefully there will be people that, that will contribute to this as well because the expenses are, are pretty high and they've had to make this, you know, it's kind of, uh, you never know exactly how much everything is going to weigh out at the end. But we're doing our best. This is a service that we offer our community that helps to connect them with our church. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it does not change the fact, however, that the day player summer program is still off the table. There will not be a day players camp this summer. We are so happy that you've come to worship with us. We're going to offer you this morning a responsive invocation. And you'll be able to see that as you watch this morning, and we'll begin right at the beginning. Rushing wind of the Spirit, breathe new life into us. Blazing flame of the Spirit, burn away our fears. Comforting presence of the Spirit, heal our wounds. Irresistible force of the Spirit, break down any walls we have erected between us and others. Creative spirit who conquers chaos, give us your power to solve problems with imagination and joy. Spirit of God, come upon us this day and fill us with your love. Make us people who will proclaim the good news of the gospel in all we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Today I'll be reading to you from Genesis 1, 1 through 2, and Acts 2, 1 through 21. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. From Acts 2, 1 through 21, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under the heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Holy Spirit, from the moment of creation through the day of Pentecost, even to today, is defined by creativity, bringing order out of chaos. And the Holy Spirit working in us is always creative. And creativity brings joy. It brings wonder. We see creativity all around us, these floral arrangements that Bruce Clark has made, the banner behind me that Lee Kruger made, the beautiful stained glass windows, creativity that brings us into the presence of God and brings us joy. And yet we must confess that when we lose our creativity, what we really are losing is the Spirit in our lives. We're not letting the Spirit work in us. And that's when we find it impossible to solve problems. We find it impossible to find peace. And so let us now go to our Lord and our Savior, go to Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in confession, confessing the ways that we have failed and seeking the Spirit in our lives. Let us confess our sins together. And we begin with our corporate confession. Pray with me if you will. On this day of Pentecost, we confess, O Lord, that we have not welcomed your Spirit into our lives as we should. Your Spirit demolishes walls of language, ethnicity, or culture that people erect. We confess to trying to build those walls back. Your Spirit offers comfort and compassion to the poor and the outcast. We confess to turning blind eyes and cold hearts to their needs. Your Spirit offers hope and joy to all the world. We confess to vainly trying to hoard them for ourselves and our kin. Convict us, Holy Spirit. By your fire, refine us. 
By your wind, enliven us. By your power, create in us again clean hearts, humble minds, and faithful hands. In the name of the Trinity, we pray. Amen. And we now confess our sins in silence. If they didn't understand it before, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples, all of Jesus' followers recognized that they were forgiven and they were empowered to go and share the gospel with all the world. Likewise, we on this day of Pentecost have confessed our sins and we are now forgiven and freed and empowered to share the gospel with all the world. Amen. Join me, if you will, in our affirmation of faith coming from the Cumberland Presbyterian Confession of Faith. God's work of reconciliation in Jesus Christ occurred at a particular time and place, yet its powers and benefits extend to the believer in all ages from the beginning of the world. It is communicated by the Holy Spirit and through such instruments as God is pleased to employ. The Holy Spirit works through the scriptures, the sacraments, the corporate worship of the covenant community, the witness of believers in word and deed, and in ways beyond human understanding. Strength I find to meet my trials here. 
Good morning, First Cumberland children and families, and good morning to everyone watching. I'm so glad that you're with us. I wanted to add some additional details from our pool announcement uh, from this morning, and this will give you just a little bit more information. As some of you may have seen, we are planning to open the pool. We've been given the green light, but I wanted to let you know it's kind of a mix between a green light and a yellow light. The pool will be open for swimming and fun, but there will be restrictions placed on the number of people that will be able to enter the pool area. In addition to, we will be enforcing social distancing, especially in the areas of seating. Routine disinfection will also be a large part of our efforts this summer. We are planning to open the pool on Monday, June 8th, just about one week from now. A team of lifeguards has been hard at work down at the pool to get it ready for that day and I can assure you that that is no small feat. The good news is that pool memberships will still be free of charge for First Cumberland members and will be available at the pool beginning on opening day. All pool memberships will be issued down at the pool this year in order to simplify that process. With that being said, I wanted to make sure that everyone understood something. The CYF committee and the session of this church understand that this year is very different the decision to open the pool was not taken lightly. Church members may receive a free membership, but the cost of operating the pool this year may fall heavily back on our membership. Without the boost of income from the day player summer camp, we're not planning to operate the pool under any sort of a profit. Quite possibly the opposite, but we just don't know. The reason we're opening the pool is this, a gesture of goodwill to the community, to our church families, our day player and learning center families as well. We hope by opening the pool and observing safety guidelines, we will be able to provide the kind of memories that kids and families should have in the summertime. We're therefore asking that if you feel moved to help support the pool this summer with a monetary gift, we will be very thankful for that. In addition, please note that if you are a Cumberland member, please plan to use your membership for your family only. If you bring guests to the pool, please plan to pay admission for those guests at that time. I want to be clear that every penny will be important this summer. I also would like to ask our church membership to pray for this endeavor, for the lifeguards, and for those who will take advantage of our pool area this summer. Pray that our efforts for disinfection and social distancing work in the ways that we hope, and that those of us that use the pool will be cooperative with all of these efforts. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact the church office and someone will get right back with you. As always, I wanna thank you for your continued support of all of our activities in the summertime that have gone on for over 60 years. In our children's moment today, I want to cover uh, that it is Pentecost Sunday. And I'm wondering if the kids sometimes remember exactly what that means. So I want to help you by giving you a little refresher. Pentecost occurred 50 days after Easter Sunday, or 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Now Jesus had already gone back to heaven, so the disciples and new believers were waiting to receive the Holy Spirit, because that's what Jesus told them was going to happen. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come, and he kept his promise. Pentecost is the day that the disciples received the Holy Spirit with a rush of wind and flames above their heads. That's quite an entrance, and it definitely got their attention. The Holy Spirit arrived and helped everyone who was there to connect, even though they spoke different languages. The disciples were then filled with the Holy Spirit so that they could go out into the world and share. So Pentecost is the day that we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and a promise fulfilled. Now people make promises every day. Sometimes we give something to another person as a sign of our promise and sometimes we seal our promise with our signature. 
And other times, we just give our word that something is something that we will promise to do something. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen a ring like this. This is my wedding ring. Um, I was married here at First Cumberland. Um, the Coopers are here. David and Christy are here, and they were married in this church also. Now, when people get married, they usually make promises to one another. They say something like, I promise to love you for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, or as long as we both shall live. Then they exchange rings as a symbol of that promise. So that's one way that people promise by actually wearing a ring. Another promise that I want to talk to you about is on these. These are ordinary letters, just like you guys receive in your mailbox every day. So right in the middle is the name of who it's supposed to go to. But what I want you to pay attention to are the things that are up in the corner. The thing right here with the, this one has an American flag on it. So what that is, is a stamp. I'm sure a lot of you have helped your parents put stamps on. When the Postal Service sells you this stamp, it's a promise that they're going to deliver it to the person that you asked them to deliver it to. So it doesn't matter if it's sunny or cold or rainy or snowy or there's a pandemic. The mail gets delivered. And that's the promise that that stamp represents. One other promise that you make is through these little things. You're too young to have one of these, but this is a credit card. But one day you probably will have one. So some adults have a credit card and they use it to buy things. And when they buy it, they have to sign their name. And what that signature actually means is, is that you are promising to pay for the item that you just bought. So your signature is actually your promise in that case. Now, people make promises every day, and they don't always keep their promises. Uh, but the promise that Jesus made for Pentecost did come true. The Holy Spirit was given to us because it was promised that it would come. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father... We don't always keep our promises, but we know that you do. Thank you for the gifts that you give us and for the Holy Spirit that teaches us, guides us, comforts us, and helps us as we go out into the world to tell others about your love. Lord, speak to us in a way that we understand, whether that's a whisper or a shout, and help us to be faithful and to keep our promises. Amen. I hope that you all have a wonderful week, and may the Lord be with you. It's a common phrase we hear in times of disaster or violence or other trouble. Your thought, my thoughts and prayers are with you. We hear politicians and newscasters, preachers and pundits utter those words. And yet, if our thoughts and prayers don't lead to action, then at best I fear that that is just a platitude we are saying, and at worst it is outright hypocrisy. We're taking up an offering today on this day of Pentecost, an offering for the Stott Wallace Mission Fund, and it is a way for us to say to missionaries around the world who are working on behalf of God to bring that Pentecost vision of everyone hearing the gospel in their own language. We're offering to them our thoughts and our prayers, but we're also offering to them a tangible means of support so that they can bring the gospel to everyone. Now, it's easy in a time of economic uncertainty, and all of us are facing that, to say, well, I just need to focus on me and mine. It'd be easy for us as a church to say, and I hope that today you're prepared to give your offering as well. We can only worry about our church, our offering, ourselves. Pentecost reminds us God is always with us. God provides us with everything, even God's presence dwelling within us. And if God's presence in the form of the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, then we can be generous. Our thoughts and our prayers can lead to action. And so as we go to God in prayer, let us go prepared to offer all of our thanksgivings, all of our concerns and intercessions to God, but also seeking for God to fill us with power that we might be His people in this part of the world and to all the ends of the earth. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, thank you so much for Pentecost.
thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Help us not to quench the Spirit within us, but to allow it to flow freely in and through us. We offer to you our prayers. Prayers of thanksgiving for this church. Prayers of thanksgiving for your sustenance, even through this time of pandemic. Prayers of gratefulness that you offer to us the wonderful gift of eternal life such that nothing on this earth can truly threaten us. Thank you, Lord, for all of your gifts. We also offer to you this day our intercessions. We ask you to be with those members of our church family and others who have lost loved ones. We ask you to continue to be with the Jones and Rayburn family with the Hornsby family and with all others who are grieving right now. We ask you to be with all those who are suffering from the effects of this pandemic, whether they are suffering physically, whether they are grieving, suffering psychologically or financially, be with them, fill them with a sense of hope and help each one of us to know the things you're calling us to do through your spirit make a difference in their lives we pray this day for our swimming pool for all those who will come to the pool this summer thank you for those who are working so hard to make it happen to be able to be open we thank you for the opportunity it offers for recreation for fellowship even if it is fellowship at a distance and I ask that even and as those waters are cooling waters from the summer heat they will also be an avenue for people to experience and accept the living water which you alone can give. We ask you to be with our Cumberland Presbyterian and other missionaries throughout the world that on this Pentecost Sunday they would continue to find creative and joyful ways to share the good news of the gospel in the very language of the people with whom they minister. And finally, Lord, we ask you again to be with us as a church, united in faith, determined to move forward as a church, as your witnesses in Chattanooga and all the world. And to that end, taking a cue from you, we pray together the very prayer which you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Pray with me, if you will. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Seems that a surgeon, an engineer, and a computer programmer were all arguing about which of their professions was the oldest. The surgeon said, well, in Genesis it says that God took a rib out of Adam and created Eve. And so obviously surgery is the oldest profession. But the engineer said, ah, but even before then, in the very first verse of the Bible... It says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the chaos and brought order and beauty to the chaos. That was the first and the best and the greatest example of engineering. Engineering is the oldest profession. The doctor and the engineer then kind of turned and looked at the computer programmer who crossed his arms and got a sly smile on his face and said, Who do you think created the chaos? In fact, Genesis doesn't tell us where the chaos came from. It simply says that the Spirit of God indeed was hovering over the chaos and began creatively working with the chaos and created out of the chaos all of the beauty that is the world. Now I should mention perhaps particularly on Pentecost Sunday that in Hebrew, if you don't already know this, the word there for Spirit of God is ruach. And that is a feminine word. And I know many of our ladies would say, yes, if you've got a bunch of chaos to take care of, you're going to have to send in a woman. She's the only one that's going to be able to take care of it. But in fact, we know that God indeed takes chaos and makes out of that chaos great order. And that has been the work of the Holy Spirit always. With creativity and with love and with joy and with purpose. God works to bring order and beauty out of chaos. And in a, a divine mystery, God uses people, human beings, to bring order out of chaos when God could do it uh, obviously easier if God just did it. But instead, God calls us to do that. And we have lots of examples of that in the Bible. The first example in the Bible of human beings being filled with the Holy Spirit are Bezalel and Ahiolub, and they are two craftsmen. And God tells Moses to take them and use them to craft the tabernacle. And God says, I'm going to put my spirit in them. And so they are to take wood and metal and cloth, and they even were to be chemists and to mix up the incense. All that was used in the tabernacle, that, that traveling, a portable temple that went with the people for the 40 years in the wilderness, all of that was either crafted or overseen by these two people that had the Spirit of God in them. They took those raw materials and out of those raw materials with creativity and with purpose and with joy created these beautiful objects and this beautiful tabernacle that allowed the people to worship. Later when Solomon created the permanent temple in Jerusalem, he used the exact same uh, floor plan that Ahilab and Bezalel used. Later, when the people were still in the wilderness, and Moses has the mantle of leadership is just starting to crush him. The people are grumbling and chaos is erupting all over the camp. God says to Moses, I'm going to take my spirit and place it on 70 elders and they will take some of the load off of you. And God's spirit and those 70 elders began to help make chaos turn into order in that community. Much, much later, Jesus offers the Holy Spirit to the disciples when he sends them out on individual missions without him. And then after his resurrection, when Jesus comes into the upper room, he offers to those who are in the upper room the Holy Spirit. And twice in that very short passage, he says, I am giving you my peace. Part of what the Holy Spirit does is brings peace in the midst of chaos. The chaos may still be all swirling around, and yet the Holy Spirit is peaceful. I see it almost like the eye of a hurricane, where there is this wonderful peace, even though there's all kinds of chaos and stuff swirling around. That's what goes on there in that upper room. 
But then on the day of Pentecost, an amazing thing happens that has never happened before in all of the history of the world, all of the ways that God has used the Holy Spirit to be able to bring order out of chaos. This gets used in a brand new way. For the Holy Spirit is poured out onto all believers. It's not just two craftsmen or 70 elders or a few disciples, but all who are believers get the Holy Spirit and they pour out into the streets of Jerusalem in great joy and creativity, sharing the gospel with all they come into contact with, bringing peace and assurance and hope to all of those people who were in Jerusalem there that day. Peter Surely, under the conviction and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in his sermon says, in the last days, remember Joel the prophet predicted that this would happen. That in the last days, I say God will pour out my spirit on all people, on men and women, on young and old, even on the lowest of the low in society, slaves. Even, says Joel, says Peter, says God, on slave girls, the very lowest of the low, I will give my spirit. And Peter says, you're seeing that happen right here today. With the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the entire universe enters into a new era. And now we are in those last days and now we see God's Spirit poured out on everyone. And that remains true to this day. All of us who are believers have the Holy Spirit within us. God dwells in us. The theological term is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But it means that God makes a home within us. And the only way that God's Spirit can be quenched is if we choose to quench it. If we choose not to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and to change us and to fill us with peace and joy and then to act on all those gifts the Spirit gives us. That's the only way the Spirit can be quenched is if we choose to quench it. And yet if we act, we know that God is with us. Now our actions may not be as flashy as some that we see in the Spirit. Some people think that if you do not speak in tongues that somehow you are not uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's not what the Bible says. Some think if I can't miraculously heal people or do some other miracle then I must not be full of the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says I pour out my Spirit on all flesh and you will be my witnesses in many amazing and diverse and wonderful ways, miraculous in their own ways, even if they aren't that flashy. More often than not, I think the Holy Spirit is not flashy, but quiet and peaceful and yet so very, very powerful. I've probably shared this story with you before, but once a number of years ago, I went to the hospital to visit a woman who was coming to the very end of her life. She had battled cancer for some time and the cancer was now winning that battle. The doctors had said, there's nothing more that we can do except to try to keep you comfortable. And so she was there in the hospital, essentially waiting to die. And I, as her pastor, came, hoping to be able to offer to her some sense of comfort and peace during that time. I walked into her room and began talking with her. And as a part of that conversation, she said to me, Courtney, I'm going to be okay. And I thought what she was telling me was, I'm praying for a miracle. I'm praying that, that even though the doctors can't do anything uh, more for me, that God will and that I'm going to be okay. I'm going to walk out of this hospital. And my response back to her was, oh, Jenny, I sure hope so. That's what we're all praying for. And she fixed me with her eye. When you hear that expression, somebody fixed you. She just really fixed my eyes to her eyes. She looked at me and she said, Courtney, you don't understand what I am saying. I am going to be okay. What she was saying was, cancer may be causing all kinds of chaos in my body. But cancer isn't the only thing living in my body. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in my body. And in spite of the cancer that may take my life, I know actually the cancer cannot come near touching me as deeply as the Holy Spirit has touched me. The cancer may be able to end my earthly life, but it cannot take away my life. I am going to be okay because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in me. Powerful. A lesson I hope I never 
forget. And a lesson I hope that when I am coming to the end of my life, I will remember I am going to be okay because the Holy Spirit is in me and has affected me in ways deeper than anything on earth can affect me. The Holy Spirit responds in creativity, sometimes subversive creativity. When we say, I am inspired, we are saying the end, the Spirit is in me, inspire, in Spirit. And so when we are trying to find ways to solve problems, when we're trying to find ways to deal with all of the difficulty and the darkness and the hatred that we see out there in the world, we can turn to the Holy Spirit for creativity, even for joy in the midst of great pain and despair and trust that the Spirit will find ways to creatively solve those problems. Gary Haugen was a young man in 1994, a recent college graduate. He went to work for the Department of Justice. And pretty early in his career there with the Department of Justice, he was sent to Rwanda to document and to take evidence from the genocide that had just taken place there. In an eight-week period, 800,000 people had been slaughtered in Rwanda. And the United Nations had assembled a team and asked various countries to, to send people to be a part of this team to document what had happened and to take evidence and to, to hear testimony that would eventually be taken to the World Tribunal so that those who had perpetrated these awful, awful crimes could be brought to justice. It was a terrible job for anyone, perhaps doubly so for a young, idealistic uh, young man who was not long out of college. He said that they went from mass gravesite to mass gravesite and even more tragically to churches or to uh, sports stadiums where bodies were just piled up. And there was no way to identify who the people were. Their job simply was to classify them. How many men, how many women, how many children, and how did they die? And it was almost always one of two ways, with a machete that had crushed their skulls or with some kind of blunt force trauma from some kind of a farm implement. This wasn't a high-tech genocide. He came home from that and he said it was so unsettling to get on a plane and, and the modern the way that the modern travel works within 12 hours or so, he leaves this place of unspeakable horror and is back at home in a happy suburb of Washington, D.C., greeting his wife and his children. And yet the things he had seen and experienced, of course, he couldn't forget. Gary's a Christian. And he began doing a little bit of research, and he realized that the church has done a marvelous job in so many ways worldwide in taking care of problems like hunger. And when there are relief programs for hunger, the church can often be on the forefront of those programs. So many people in our world need fresh drinking water and the church is often the one that is out there drilling wells. The church is the one sending medical missionaries out there to take care of people who are suffering from various medical ailments. The church is working with poverty and with education. But he realized that the church, indeed almost nobody, was working on the problem of violence. And that it doesn't really matter if you help someone with a food or you help someone with a well so they can start a farm or you help someone with uh, some kind of a disease that they have or, or with education. If they're starting to get their lives back together and the people with machetes show up, none of that other stuff really matters. And so he sensed the Holy Spirit calling him. You need to do something about the violence in the world. And so in what is obviously a Holy Spirit moment, he says he resigned from his job at the Department of Justice on Friday. And on Saturday he convened some other friends of his and they talked about what could be done. And they decided that they would form an organization they would call the International Justice Mission. And on Sunday they went and worshipped together. And on Monday morning he started his job as the only employee of the International Justice Mission. And they decided very early on that they knew that they could not, as a tiny organization, even a government would have trouble, they could not possibly end human trafficking in the world. They could not end slavery and sweatshops throughout the world. They could not end police corruption that allowed violence to happen 
throughout the world. And so they decided we're going to take cases on a case-by-case basis. Individually, we're going to try to help people. And we're going to trust if we help one individual in one particular place, that's going to kind of become a domino effect. And that will help other people. One of the first cases that Gary took on was a woman named Catherine. She had been horribly sexually abused by a man in her village. And that man's father was the police commander of that village. And so although an arrest warrant was issued, none of the local police would arrest that man. He knew that he could do whatever he wanted to with impunity. And so he would come by and harass Catherine and threaten her. And she knew he could do anything he wanted to her. And she had no recourse. But the International Justice Mission found out about her. And Gary says, all we really had was a rather fancy letterhead that we had come up with. International Justice Mission, Washington, D.C., with a really fancy seal on it. And so they wrote a letter on that letterhead. It has come to the attention of the International Justice Mission that an arrest warrant has been issued for this man, and yet it has not been executed. And this woman is still living in fear. And we, the International Justice Mission, would like to know what you plan to do about this. When will this warrant be executed? And they mailed that letter to the police commander of the entire country of the Philippines. About a week later, Gary says he got a fax. Now, for those of you who are too young to know what a fax is, it's kind of like an email, except it comes in on paper. And so this paper comes out of the machine, and it is the front page of the Manila National Newspaper, the biggest newspaper in the Philippines. And the front page above the fold, the headline says, International Letter Leads to Arrest of Rapist. And at that moment, Gary knew the Holy Spirit is at work. With nothing more than a fancy letterhead and a letter, he had found justice for Catherine. And he assumed others would find justice as well. We don't want to get any more letters from the International Justice Mission. Let's make sure we're executing all of the arrest warrants that we have issued. To date, some 20-some years later, the International Justice Mission can point to over 53,000 individuals that they have helped. And they know there are countless others that they have helped because of the work that they have done that they don't even know about and never, ever will know about. Isn't that wonderful Holy Spirit work? Creative, even joyful, subversive in a kind of sneaky sort of way, but a wonderful gospel sort of way. It sounds just like the Holy Spirit to me. Not to get lost in the numbers, but to focus on individuals. But also not to get so focused on the individuals you don't recognize that your job is to bring order to the overall chaos. The Holy Spirit comes with creativity and with love, with persistence and with hope. The Holy Spirit brings light into the dark places. And each one of us, who are believers in Jesus Christ, who already have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, are called to follow in the steps of people like Gary, or people like Peter, or people like Bezalel and Ohialib, and use the gifts the Holy Spirit gives to us to bring order out of the chaos, to bring beauty out of ugliness, to bring love into hatred, to bring light into dark places. We may not at the end of our lives be able to say that we transformed 53,000 or more people's lives. That's not the point. The point is to do what we are called to do, where we are called to do it, when we are called to do it. As we celebrate Pentecost this day, we look back and we remember that wonderful first day of Pentecost. But we also recognize we are still living in those days when God is still pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, young or old, rich or poor, educated or not. None of those divisions matter. What matters is the Holy Spirit is working with you. And if only you will allow it, you will be able to see the power of the Holy Spirit. May that be true in all of our lives. Amen. We've already reflected and celebrated today upon the fact that one of the wonderful gifts the Holy Spirit gives to us is peace in the midst of chaos. 
And I'm so thankful that the blessing that God gave to Moses is a blessing that promises us peace. And so whatever chaos that you may be living through right now, hear this blessing and know that it is, it is a blessing from the Holy Spirit to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.